49th day after my arrival. Dear diary, today I'm going to meet with Clan Silpin. The translator translated their rank as Count, no idea how accurate that is. I have no idea how our noble titles worked back when they were anything other than fancy add-ons to the name. But apparently, they are about the lowest rank of high nobility, if I understood that right. Sil said I should have no issue dealing with them. They aren't very influential even for their rank, and their territory isn't far from the palace. They apparently adopted the childhood friend of their daughter when his parents died, so they seem to be nice people. Not that it would help to reduce my nervousness. What if I say something wrong? Even unintentional insults seem to be a big deal here. I mean, I rejected all these invites for some mundane reasons that I pulled out of my ass. Sil said that's apparently normal for first contacts. Like, seriously? I get that some basic show of respect is important, but if humanity also was like that at one point, I'm really glad that's in the past. Imagine I would have grown up like some noble lady from these medieval movies, where every conversation is basically a battlefield. I don't think I could have handled that my entire life. Sil told me what would be some good things to say to leave a friendly impression, and I practiced some lines as well. I don't know if I can keep up the act the entire time, though. Maybe I can get in a flow, like when I had to hold a presentation back at school. Still, I have to get this right, if for no other reason as to not embarrass Sil, and I guess she's right leaving the palace now, and then probably isn't a bad idea. Especially right now, since I can really use a distraction at the moment, and there are only so many language lessons I can cram into my head to achieve that. Even if the Baron is surprised by my progress, how come I have no issues talking with him? He has some grandpa vibes, maybe that's why. But the first messengers still sent out to search for clues are scheduled to return soon, and I'm really scared. What if no one found anything? I should have a quick talk with Kiritan before I go. I hope he can calm me down. His present is also almost done. I hope he likes it. Maybe I can make the next one on my own, but I doubt it. I didn't contribute much outside of the idea this time. All right, I can do this. I just have to see it as my mission to my people. If I can pull this off, Homai will already have a good impression of humanity, and things will be much easier in the future. Countess Espin and Count Aurelis felt equally stiff as they guided their esteemed guest into their garden. There had been so many things they had needed to prepare that actually making their estate presentable had fallen short. It was by no means untidy. It got properly cared for every day, and if it had been a normal guest, they would have received them there without a second thought. Alas, the current one was literally as far away from a normal guest as possible, and a blunder could be catastrophic for their species' future with the humans. Sure, she had said that she merely wished to socialize for now, but bad impressions would obviously carry over. But then, through a stroke of luck, the current day had presented itself as one of the rare dry ones in the rainy season. Quickly adjusting their plans, they decided to host Lady Nadine in their garden instead. Their house was about lower average for a noble clan of their standing, but the garden was something their one and an was they were proud of. The fact that they got a chance to show it off could prove to be a large boon for the impression they left. They were truly fortunate in that regard. Occasionally, there were cycles where the rain, once truly started, didn't stop at all for up to 50 days. Thank the first ones, this wasn't one of those. Seeing their guest in person had been the next surprise. Having only seen her during the broadcast of the trial, they had completely underestimated how short her species was. But once again, luck was on their side. Since they sometimes had guests with children of Falpine's age, they possessed some custom-made chairs from back when she was younger. They allowed someone of a shorter height to sit at the same table while still fitting in aesthetically with the rest. Espin had to thank the quick thinking of her partner, who upon seeing their guest had almost instantly given the order to get those before she was in earshot. She herself had entirely forgotten they still had those. Reaching the small table surrounded by vast and diverse plant life, they gestured their guest to her seat. The edges of her mouth moved up as she saw the special chair. Her shoulders also for a moment seemed to move up and down in quick succession, and the rims of her mouth seemed to get slightly pulled inward. Not entirely sure what this expression meant, the Count and Countess merely sat down not showing their nervousness as both had learned to from an early age. That didn't stop them from getting a short panic attack when the chair under their guest creaked. Why was it making that noise? 
They hadn't used these chairs for a while. Did they corrode without them noticing it? Buy the first ones, please don't break, Bo thought desperately. Well then, let me once again thank you for having me. It is our pleasure, milady. We have prepared a few things for you. On cue, a servant pushed a tray of food next to them, filled with almost every food item they were told humans could eat, including, they almost couldn't believe, that part when they heard it, unpurified water. The alien noblewoman gave a sign of appreciation and reached out, before stopping suddenly, the blue circles in her eyes moving to the side for a tig. The two immediately feared they had made a mistake, but her eyes quickly went back to their usual position and Lady Nadine took a fruit from the tray. A few moments of silence followed. Was she waiting for them to initiate the conversation? Was it common for humans that the host chose the first topic? You have a pretty garden, she finally said, leaving the Count and Countess unsure whether everything was fine or if they had just committed their first blunder. It is great to hear that it is to your liking, as Spine responded. You have chosen a perfect day for it. I am sorry that you have to see this part of our homeworld during the rainy season. There is a lot of beauty found in this region. It was, after all, one of the reasons why guests from off-planet were received here, assuming their culture didn't have an entirely different sense of beauty. But since she praised their garden, they could take that gamble. It is, I actually arrived before the rain started, so I was able to see my share. My kind had never met other sentient species outside of our own until now. It is highly fascinating to observe our similarities, but there are also many ways in which our kinds develop vastly divergent. There are many aspects that are all still very new to me. Her Highness and I are currently testing how an exchange of our admittedly very different cultures could profit all of us. Once more, her eyes seem to wander to the side. On a different note, may I ask about your children? That question completely blindsided the two. Why would she ask that? Children usually only mattered in these talks to form ties between clans. That wasn't something other species would participate in, or even could participate in, as no descendant could be conceived between them. We actually just have one, a daughter, Countess Espin answered truthfully. But we are also taking care of the heir of Clan Rylar until he is old enough to inherit his title. I see. And those two, they wouldn't happen to be close to finishing their education? Okay, she definitely is trying to get somewhere with this. But what? Was she trying to prod their skills in raising their heir? Or did she just not want to get disturbed? Well, close is a relative term. They still got a lot to learn. But they know how to behave, so don't worry. They won't bother us. Oh, I would hardly be bothered by their presence. On the contrary, if it is fine with you, I would love to meet them. Once again, more or less the opposite of what both had expected. Are you sure? Count Ariles asked. Lasting friendships bridge generations, do they not? Well, um, that they do, Ariles agreed. Very well then, I shall have them called momentarily. Thank you, but there is no need. They heard me. The two grew quiet. In fact, the entire garden did. The alien noblewoman took a sip of water before breaking the silence. Don't you two wish to join us? I doubt the stone is very comfortable. Staring in disbelief, the two watched their daughter and their ward slowly stand up from behind the balustrade of the elevated walkway. Clearly ashamed, Falpine guided her adoptive brother to the table. Unable to scold them in front of their guest who had somehow known they were there from the start, Aurelis ordered for two more chairs to be brought. Lady Nadine didn't appear to be angry, so this situation wasn't unsalvageable. Ha! Huh? Hello, milady. Falpine stammered while Riken couldn't get a word out. Lady Nadine, Espine quickly took over. This is our daughter, Falpine, and the heir of Clan Rylar, Riken. A pleasure to meet the two of you, she addressed them. So the two of you are learning to take over your respective titles? You, yes, milady. Then say, would you like to assist Her Highness at the Star Palace for a while? I heard she will soon start taking children under her tutelage at frequent intervals to allow them to gather some practical experience. Once more silence. None of the four said anything. None of the four knew what they could say to this. Direct tutelage under the princess? This has, of course, nothing to do with me, Lady Nadine continued. I'm just thinking aloud that someone who knew about this prior 
might have good chances to get the first spots. This was too good to be true. They were mere counts. How could they have possibly imagined a chance like this for their daughter? But, but Raikin finally found his voice. I, I am. M my eyes? I noticed, the alien noblewoman said to everyone's surprise. They had expected her to lose interest in him as soon as she found out. Just like all the ducal clans did, which was why they, mere counts, had been able to adopt him in the first place. The dukes considered Clan Raylar more or less done for and were ready to snatch up the remains. But she didn't seem to care. I won't pretend that it doesn't matter. It is obviously a big deal. But I also know that there have been many humans in the past with similar situations to your own. And it couldn't stop them, because it can only do that if you allow it to. If you put your mind to it, I have no doubts that you can achieve great things, both for yourself and your clan. As long as you don't give up, they had lost count of how often they had gotten phased in this very short time frame. The entirety of this day hadn't played out even closely to their expectations. After that, they somehow managed to resume normal talks, with Falpin and Rajikin mostly listening. That, of course, didn't mean the two wouldn't get to hear some things later on. At one point, Count Aerialis brought up a rumor he had heard from the capital, and Lady Nadine left shortly after. Finishing her work for the day, Silgvani stood up from her desk. It was still a bit tedious to only have two of her forearms available, but it was doable now that things had calmed down and the doctor finally allowed her to leave her bed again. The much bigger pain had been the time she hadn't been able to work today, which had been almost all of the day because her expected molting had finally happened. Just molting under normal circumstances was already incredibly annoying. It was a long and tedious process gradually wiping off the remains of the outer shell as they slowly turned into a gooey sludge. And she had servants to help her with it. She didn't even want to imagine how it was for those who had to do it alone. But if molting under normal circumstances was annoying, molting under medical supervision because two of your arms were in splints, with the servants needing to come up with a creative way to clean out under said splints, while also having to be careful not to further injure, said arms was really annoying. But at least it was done now, she no longer had a cavity in her belly she needed to hide, and her arms would hopefully heal with her next molding. It was, however, not yet time to retreat into her private quarters, as there were at least two more things today that required her attention. One was to hear out Nadine about her day. The other was her checkup with the doctor, which she promptly commenced to do. It was the same standardized test she was by now used to plus the normal post-molding check. It seems as though your new shell has hardened properly, your highness, the doctor concluded once she was done, and your other results continue to improve as well. Thank you, doctor. Is that all? Silgvani realized that she had sounded a bit more dismissive than intended. Maybe it was because all these repetitive tests were little more than time-consuming routines by now. The doctor, however, seemed to not agree with that assessment. Your Highness, with all due respect, you do realize how insanely lucky you were with this, right? Even if we assume that Nadine and myself would be able to help you as quickly as we could in every scenario, this could have easily ended in countless other ways, all much worse than two broken arms and an impressively short period of recovery, right? I did by no means intend to sound ungrateful, Doctor. You and Nadine are the sole reason I am alive today, and that is something I won't forget. Your word humble me, your highness, but that is not what I was trying to get. Sill, the shout of a familiar voice interrupted the doctor, although the two of them rarely heard the voice being this loud. The doctor stood up, opened the freshly repaired door, and waved to the small alien who entered the office shortly after. Ah, here you are. That I am, Silvani affirmed. How did your visit go? Good, I guess, but there's something else we need to talk about first. They apparently heard a rumor that two and a half weeks ago, a large number of warships flew off from the northern harbor into space. The princess cocked her head. Two and a half what? A couple of days, not important. Do you have any ideas why that might be the case? Was Nadine concerned by this rumor? Well, if her home was like she had described, it was understandable. Sudden troop movements could imply a lot of things if you lack context. Silgvani unfortunately almost never interacted with their fleet, as the military didn't fall under her authority, so she herself didn't know why they were doing that. 
I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. I don't have much to do with our military, but I can think of three possible reasons, depending on what large number means. Option one would be that they are switching places with one of the flotillas guarding the secure routes so they can get their maintenance done. Option two would be that they are being swapped with ships from the main fleet who are guarding our orbit. Okay, and in case large number refers to a really large number? Well, that would be option three. The main fleet got ordered to move out and they are temporarily taking over their position in orbit. But that would only happen in case of a large scale military operation. And since such a thing would most certainly be done in cooperation with other Alliance members, that is something I would have heard of. The only other way would be something so urgent and important that they couldn't wait for an answer. But we're not at war anymore, so I have no idea what that would be. The Kurosha never attacked us in that manner. Nadine flinched at the mention of the insectoids, and Silgvani cursed herself for bringing them up. Nadine's trauma had gotten better, but not vanished. Shortly after thou, the alien girl's eyes narrowed and she got quiet for a while. Then, she turned for the door. I see, but just to be sure, let me check something really quick. Where are you going? The dungeon. Call it a hunch, but I have a really bad feeling about this.